Good evening. Welcome to God's house this uh, Saturday evening. We are having
I am having technical difficulties, so there'll be no screen uh, for us to watch uh, as the internet is going in and out kind of spotty. For some reason, I'll check with Carl tomorrow on that, and we'll get it fixed by next weekend. But welcome to God's house. So you'll be using the uh, red hymnal, as many of you have become accustomed to over the, the years, uh, as well as what's in our bulletin to lead us and guide us in worship. Let's begin with our first song of praise, hymn number 141, At the Lamb's High Feast We Sing. Continue our worship with the invocation. Lord, all 
continue with our singing our praise to God with Psalm 1. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. first scripture lesson comes from Deuteronomy 18, beginning at verse 15, to find in your worship folder. It's also our sermon text for this evening's worship. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. This is the word of the Lord. We join together our voices in a seasonal response. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Our gospel for this evening is Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. 
This is the gospel of our Lord. We join our voices in another song of praise, hymn number 556. Rise and shine, you people. portion of God for our meditation is from that first lesson, from Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning at 15. I'll just read the opening paragraph for us. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. Please join me in a a prayer for the message this evening. Lord Jesus Christ, be present now. Our hearts in true devotion bow. Your spirit sin with grace divine, and let your truth within us shine. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, fellow redeemed children of God. You know who wrote that, who got inspired to write that text, right? Many of you know it. Uh, you've heard about him since he was a baby. He was put into a, a basket and set out on the Nile River by his mother for safety. He was then rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and, and taken into her home as, as she adopted him as her child. And he was raised in the palace. You know the person who wrote this because he was the one that was so upset about what was going on, he, he killed a guard and therefore, therefore he had to flee for his life and became a, a fugitive. And while he was on the lamb, as they call it, he met his wife Zipporah. And his father-in-law then became Jethro. You, you know the man who wrote this, who God had write the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we call them the, the Pentateuch. The five books of Moses. Moses wrote this text. Moses is the same one that God called at the, the side of the mountain, that burning bush, and he, he called him to lead his people out of Egypt and back to the land he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Moses who said he, he didn't speak well. Moses who had all the, every excuse in the book. Right? And it wasn't really a book back then, but you know what I mean. And all the excuses. And yet God called him to lead his people. So Moses did. God used him. God used him as his vessel, a prophet of God to speak the truth to people. It wasn't just to the Israelites. He spoke truth to Pharaoh about who God was and what God wanted for his people. But Pharaoh didn't listen. It's the ten plagues. He spoke truth to the people when they complained and they grumbled about not having enough water or good tasting water or, or enough food or the right kind of food. And, and, and why would we go to this desert to die? He, he spoke the truth of God to them. God has already spoken. He has always spoken through his prophets. Even after Moses, you know, there's Joshua, he spoke to Joshua, who led the people of God, he spoke to Samuel, who spoke to Eli, and then to Saul, and to David, and then led the people of Israel for a while. He used prophets like Elijah and Elisha and Nathan. They didn't write down books. God didn't inspire them to write that down for us, but he used them to speak the word of God to people. And then all those minor prophets, you know, or the major and minor, Isaiah through Malachi, all those books that we call the major and minor prophets. God used all of them to speak his word to the people. And sometimes it wasn't easy. It was not just fun words like, hey, I love you. Sometimes it was disciplinary and it was tough. It was law. And so today in our text, we see one of those such moments of God's law being spoken to people. In our, in our text, it says, the people said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God. You remember that moment? If you have your Bible open, I'm not sure if you do, but if you go to Exodus 20, you'll see the text. In Exodus 20, God has already brought them out of Egypt. He has brought them through the Red Sea, and they, had, they needed help understanding what God wanted for them because they had lived for so long in a foreign land with foreign gods and picked up some foreign habits about what God, how he wants them to live. And so God says, I'm going to give you the law. And he gives them what we call the Ten Commandments, that moral law. Those first 16 or 17 verses or so, you got God telling the Israelites how they should treat him, how they should treat his name, how they should worship him. Then he goes on to tell them how they should treat each other, those in authority and, and those in your life that, that have husbands and wives. You should, you should respect each other and, and not take from each other and not be greedy and not, not hate each other. And then I want what's not yours to have. And he goes and gives them all these laws. And the funny thing in, in this moment is that that's not the problem. The Israelites hear that being said, and after he gives them all these laws, there was no problem. No, there was no conversation negatively back toward God about the laws. And down to verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning, and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. It wasn't the words of the law, it wasn't the, the commandments per se that gave them pause and caused them to be filled with fear. It's when God, who had given that law, showed his power and majesty. God who said, this is how you should treat me, said, this is how powerful I am. He showed them through lightning and thunder, and then they trembled with fear because they knew they had not kept those laws. They had not put God first. They had not put his name first. They, they had not kept worshiping him even as they were captives. They, they did not treat each other well. They knew that. And they knew that the God that could bring about thunder and lightning could destroy them. The God who could part the Red Sea could put them right back in there. The God that could deliver them from Pharaoh's hand with those ten plagues could crush them. And so they trembled with fear because of the power and majesty of God, the God who gave the law. Because really, I mean, all laws are. We have laws in our land. We've got laws like meeting limits. When does it become a problem for you? When you get pulled over. The law is there. You see the letters. You see the numbers, 65, and then it says on top of the speed, bottom limit. And, and you see that, and you go, oh, that's nice. And you keep driving 80. 
until those lights come on, and then you go, man, that law. Because then it affects you because there's power now behind that law. Same thing with the Israelites. They had the law. He gave them the law like, those are nice things, God. Yeah, those, those are really good ideas. And then God went, and they went, okay, he's serious. And they tremble with fear. And then they said to, to Moses, um, hey, hey, Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And so God, who had called Moses to lead them out of Egypt to Israel, now has the people asking for Moses to be the mouthpiece. The earpiece from God and the mouthpiece to them, and be a prophet. That's where it started. They didn't want to hear the word of, of God from the almighty God who could crush. The application seems simple to me, but I'll share it with you anyway in case we're on different points here. But we're like the Israelites. God has given us that same law, that same word of God, and, and we treat it like so many speed limits that we care so little about. God says, put me first above all things. We go, that's a nice thought, God, but I've got to make money, so this job comes first. And then I've got to feed my family, so this job comes first. And, and, and my wife and my husband, they really need me to be this. So I've got to put them first. And, but that's a nice thought, God, maybe someday. Oh, we should honor you in worship, so you mean we shouldn't be doing different things? I remember when I was in high school and college, I was so... We studied vocables and we did all the study we could during that 15 minutes of chapel because we thought that was more important than, than focusing on God's word because that, that test or that quiz was going to determine our life. And you do those things and you forget that in that moment you're not putting God's word or worshiping him as you should. But you're actually despising the preaching of his word. And oh, honor and father and mother and those in authority, that, that's out the window as soon as it's not what we want. As soon as we can, we can shout back at mom or dad and, and we get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of vigor. I'm not listening to mom. I'm a grown man. I'm, I'm grown. Can I, can I borrow somebody? You know, we have those moments in life, right? Well, authority doesn't matter for us until we need something and then we want it. We, you know, so we, that's a nice thought, God, but I, I don't really want to honor authority. I, I want to be my own authority. And then you can do all the, all the laws, all the commandments. But they're not bad words, that they're good guidelines, and, and, and we should try to use them, and, and they're really nice things. And then we realize that that same God that gave us those laws, the same God that created heaven and earth, the same God that created you and me, and has the right to crush us. And then like the Israelites go, whoa, and there's fear there. And like the Israelites go, I don't know if I, if I want to hear that word anymore because I'm not living according to it. I'm, I'm not doing those things you are asking and, and telling me to do. I'm, I'm not treating my neighbor with kindness and with love. I'm, I'm being disrespectful to those in authority, and I'm not honoring you with my life. And so we hear those words, and like the Israelites, which sometimes we didn't know them. But God heard the Israelites, and he didn't say, okay, fine, they don't tell them anything. He sent his prophet to preach the word to them. And so Moses is that first one in the line of prophets. God says, I'll raise up for them a prophet like him. What does that mean to be a prophet like Moses? Does that mean height and weight and, and all those measurables that you see? You know, if you go to a, if you're watching the boxing match, they got the height, weight, length, you know, they got all those things in there, the measurables. Is that what we have to be look, look, look like Moses? No. To speak like Moses, to have that same accent, that, that half Israelite, half Egyptian accent that I'm sure he had? No. To be like Moses means that you speak the word of God to people, not your own words or others' words, but the word of God. And that's what Joshua and the other prophets did behind him, Moses. And those are immediate fulfillments of that, of that word of God, that all those prophets from Joshua to Malachi or the immediate fulfillment of that prophecy, but, but there was one greater coming who was going to be greater than Moses. And it, so it's a really neat trick. I, I'll share this with you. I'm not sure if it will resonate. It was on the screen, but that's... Sorry. So the root words, the root uh, consonants for Joshua 
Yeshua. Yeshua. If you take the name Jesus in the Old, in the Old Testament Hebrew, Yeshua. And so the immediate prophecy fulfillment of, of, of Moses having a prophet like him was Joshua, who brought the people to the promised land, who conquered nations around them and defeated them that they might have the land that God promised. Fast forward. Then, then Yeshua comes. Jesus is born, one who was saved. And he defeated those who would hold us away, keep us away from God's salvation. He conquered Satan, death, and, 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 and hell, and, and gave us eternal life. Yeshua. So that's one of those neat little tricks that God did. It, I, I'm not saying he did it for that reason, but I, I found it kind of cool. I was studying it, had this big old smile and grin on my face, like, yeah, God! But the prophet after Moses was Yeshua. The prophet that saves us, Yeshua. Jesus saves. And Jesus is more than just another prophet. As some would have us believe and want us, to, want us to teach. He is the prophet who is called the Messiah, who, who sacrificed his life for us on the cross, who shed his blood so that we might have forgiveness. Forgiveness for all those times when we couldn't stand at the foot of that mountain and hear God's law because we had sinned. Forgiveness for all those times when we have decided to just discard God's word because it seems too harsh or it seems too much for us to keep. All those times when we'd rather duck and hide than face God. Jesus stood there and faced God for us. He stood there like Moses did for the people. And when he heard the words of God, the harsh punishment that we deserve was on his shoulders. that we go to the promised land so we could have eternal salvation, eternal life. We could have salvation. That's what Jesus did as the prophet. The prophet foretold long ago. The prophet who, 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 was, who lived and walked and, and breathed for us. Nowadays, as in, in, in our way of understanding, we don't have prophets anymore. Because God's word is there. It says, don't add or subtract from my word. That there's no need for other prophets because he's given us his word. His word from Genesis all the way through Revelation, he gives us his word. He says, this is what I want you to know. Genesis is the lead up all the way through Malachi to where Jesus was born. That was the reason that he gave them prophets and he, he kept the, the nation by themselves. And then Jesus tells us how we are to live all the way through and that Revelation is a victory. We don't need any more. Now, now, there are wise words. You and I share each other wise words about how we should live and what we should do and who we should be in God. But that's not prophecy because it's according to the word of God. It's the same word of God that, that you and I learn. There's nothing new being said. It may be said in a way that is encouraging and inspiring, but it's still the word of God. And if it's not, if it's not the word of God, if, it doesn't get, if it's not consistent with the word of God, but a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is put to death. So I guess that the, the, the last part of our text is saying, be careful. Be careful what you say to people on behalf of God. That you, you dare not say what God has not said. <laughs> be careful who you listen to about the word of God, because if it's not in line with God's word, then don't listen to it, because it's it's not God. Because you have the truth. You have the truth right out of the prophet's mouth. The God who loves you sent his son who died for you and heaven is yours by faith. And instead of trying to be a prophet about that moment, he says you get to be a witness. And so you and I have the privilege of, of sharing with the world what we already know. That Christ Jesus came and died for their sins so we can be a witness to them so that they don't have to be afraid. You know, you think we're, you think we're afraid of, of God's wrath and punishment? Imagine the unbeliever who doesn't want God in public spaces. Unbeliever doesn't want God's word in schools. Who are so afraid of hearing that truth of God's word, they want to make it subjective and, and on this kind of scale type thing instead of there being an objective truth absolute truth. We get to share with them that there is an absolute truth. 
that there is a way that is the way to life. That is Jesus Christ, our prophet, our Messiah, our Savior. We God bless you as his witnesses, as you share that gospel message with the world. Let us join our voices in the Te Deum on page four of your worship folder. We praise you, O God. We claim you as Lord. this time we would only gather our offerings to our Lord. Uh, if you'd like to give to this ministry, there's a box in the back if you leave. Uh, please fill out the first register in your pew. It gives us a record of your visit and also how we can serve you in the future. I don't know if you've done this or not, but if you if you haven't, subscribe to our Facebook page. Go do that too and, and all those good things. I'm, I'm, I'm curiously finding that there are a lot of people that have been in contact with our social media faces. I'm not sure how much they're getting, but the more we can encourage that, the more those who may not be willing to come or able to come and that can find that and enjoy that more easily. So please do that. Facebook, uh, YouTube, whatever you can find. Thank you. Um, and then as far as the prayers, uh, Friday.
close the final hymn of the day, hymn number 281. Good evening. Thanks for joining us for worship. The end of the year statements are available for those who uh, like those for their taxes. They're back on the table in the Catholic Cafe. And uh, they're also available those for the upcoming year that you can grab as well. So please do that. Um, follow this. I believe John, I think we should still do Bible study. We'll see who wants to stay for it. If, if no one else stays, we'll just talk about, about um, world events, but a Bible study about the families of the Bible. I'll leave two more of those, and uh, I think that's it. May God bless the rest of your day.